to the latest edition of Disrupted by Design, a podcast featuring the voices of emerging leaders, those folks who are under 40 in the broad AFSIA, Armed Forces and Communications and Electronics Association environment across the defense military IT space. Today I'm sitting down with Matt Klein he, and we're going to talk all things marketing. So Matt is a growth and communications lead for a specific portfolio at CACI. He's in the agile solutions factory, and he talks all about kind of what that is and, and kind of how you market, um, you know, related to, you know, software and that kind of agile development. But he has, he's had great experience in marketing, you know, across many sectors. So he talks, you know, the skills that are needed and kind of, you know, what to know and the tools you'll need if you're interested in marketing. And he also went to James Madison University. And so I asked him kind of how he got, you know, into his field, how he knew he wanted to study marketing. So he, he actually wanted to study business ma or management. Um, early on and then switched to marketing. So I found that interesting, you know, to kind of hear how people find their way into the field that they end up, you know, having a lot of love and passion for. So welcome and hear all about marketing with Matt Klein. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining our Disrupted by Design podcast. I'm here today with Matt Klein. Thanks so much, Matt, for coming to FCA. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and tell us your uh, title and uh, where you work. So I work at CACI. I'm, I'm their Agile Solution Factory Growth and Communications Lead, and I've been working there for about two years now. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and I love, um, you know, I've talked to kind of different people with the podcast, but I'm so excited to kind of delve into the marketing side of things with you today, and that Absolutely. was kind of uh, a newer area for me. I even had our... Um, we have a great marketing team here at AFSIA with Howard, Chrissy, and Alex, and they kind of helped me prepare to talk to you as I was preparing for the interview. But um, maybe start out by kind of how did you know, like back in college, how did you pick marketing, you know, and why did you choose it, I guess? Yeah, you know, actually I started off in management at, at JMU, so I went to James Madison University, and I started off in management knowing that I, wanted, I knew I wanted to go into business. Um, in fact, you know, I, I, even at a young age, I remember going door to door, um, you know, for, I was in an orchestra back in high school and we'd sell cheesecakes and everything to door to door and stuff. So I always had kind of an affinity towards working with people and, and um, kind of that, I guess that sales mindset in a way. Um, and I knew I wanted to go, you know, the business route. And uh, I saw that as kind of the, the, the road to success in a way. And I liked, again, working for people. I always had affinity for creativity uh, and writing, and, and that, was, that was very interesting to me. And so midway through my, um, my year at, at, at JMU, I decided to kind of go the marketing route. And uh, I, I stuck with that. You know, it, it was also kind of inspired, I think, from watching a little bit of Mad Men, uh, being pretty, pretty excited about, you know, just the idea. Again, the creativity side of things and, um, you know, coming up with, with new ideas, advertising, campaigns. That was always very interesting to me. Oh, yeah, interesting. And then how did you pick JMU? Um, my daughter went there for grad school, and so we, we had a great um, experience with them. And I feel like it's, um, it's such a beautiful place. Um, the school itself seems to really cater to kids and give them flexibility for figuring out what they want to study. You know, it's it, compared to other schools. But tell us why you picked there and, and why you're a DC. <laughs> yeah, you know, I could go on and on about, about my experience at JMU. Um, you know, I was originally kind of looking at a few different schools. Um, I narrowed it down to, you know, two in-state schools. Um, I was looking at Virginia Tech, I was looking at JMU, um, and, uh, and at the time, too, I was looking at some of the, the business school rankings, you know, I wanted to go into business. Uh, but ultimately, I remember calling the admissions office, and I, I asked them um, at both schools, kind of, why, why should I go to this school? Oh, that's interesting, you yeah. know, I was just kind of more, I guess, wanting to just hear straight from the folks that were there, and. Uh, it was really kind of, it stood out to me knowing that when I spoke to the folks at JMU, they actually said, you know what, why don't we link you on with some of the folks at the business school? 
And so rather than just talking to the admissions officer, they said, look, talk, let me get you on the phone with somebody over at the, the, the business school. So I actually, within seconds, I was transitioned over to somebody over there and, and they were talking to me about what it would look like, what my journey would be like there at JMU. And I was like, oh, I was pretty impressed by that answer and how they kind of uh, you know, answered some of my questions. And um, I remember getting doing early uh, action, or early acceptance at, at JMU. And um, I went to what they called choices. And it was, you know, in the middle of winter uh, when they would already accept you there. And, and you get there um, and, you know, you go to the, the convocation center and everything. And they, they kind of tell you a little bit more about JMU. And I remember just walking out afterwards. You talked about how beautiful the campus is and everything. And I walked out of that convocation center and it was starting to snow. Oh. And that was kind of, you know, I didn't really know it right then in that moment, but I kind of did at the same time. It was like, it was kind of a, a sign saying, this is, this is a place I could kind of see uh, as being home. And it was, it was two, two hours away from where I grew up here in Burke, Virginia. Um, and I just felt like, you know, that was a place for me. Oh yeah, very cool. So those are good tips. If anybody has people in their lives who are looking at colleges, call them and ask them, for their point of view, like why should I come here? You know, what's their, you know, how they and how they handle that, and and I think it's so important to be on a campus and get that kind of feeling. You know that. Yeah, you know, that 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 moment. There's that moment I think where you're like, you know, what this is, this is a place I can see myself. You can visualize yourself being there. Yeah. Um, you visit some of the classrooms. I mean, I definitely did my, my college campus tours, and um, again, I looked into the the schools of study that I was interested in too. Like I knew that. You know, I wanted that kind of broad education. I wanted a, a great community, great culture. Um, you know, and and while I could, I probably could have gotten that. You know, Virginia Tech is up too. Um, also a great school. This one was a little bit closer to home, and um, and you know, I had sisters over at EVA too, and so family was really really, really important stuff to me too, being close by. Uh, so just know what your, what your values are, and know you know what's important to you, and and pick the best school that that kind of fits that that mold for you. Right. Sure. And then tell us. Um, you know, you're in marketing, what are kind of the skills maybe that you need to develop to go into marketing? And then kind of maybe once you're in the field, um, you know, how to, what kind of tools and skills do you need at that point? Sure, I think off the bat, when I was looking at um, getting into marketing, again, I, I always had affinity for, for writing, um, you know, good creativity, uh, people skills. Those were some of the things I think off the bat that really had me interested in marketing. Okay, yeah. Um, I, again, I always wanted to, create campaigns and, and drive results in that way and uh, again the, the business aspects of, of things really interested me um, but I think once you get into the field I think that is where, where with anything I mean you, you learn all new skills and, and tools and, and traits while you're working and while you're out there in the field in fact I remember working at um, you know at a, a technology company and within the first week on the job I was learning HTML oh, and, yeah. and then a week later I was asked to be the expert <laughs> Uh, you know, so a lot of times you're, you'll be asked to take on new roles, and I think you should actually go out and, and accept those roles, even if you feel like, you know, you may not know it all. You may not know every piece of a role or of a job that you're going to be taking on, but you learn while you're there, and guess what? Now that you have that under your belt, you can now use that as you're applying for new roles and say, you know what, I've done this. I learned this. I did this on the job. And now I'm, I, can, I can use that as I apply other places, other rules. Uh, I've been able to add a lot of different tools and, and skill sets into my belt as I've become a well-rounded marketer. I mean, when it comes to email marketing, social media marketing, uh, writing for the web, um, creating campaigns and uh, newsletters, um, again, HTML, website design, working with designers. Um, I've done all sorts of different things in that realm, and I've done that both in the private sector while also working with government clients and contracts. Okay, sure. And tell us kind of the things you're working on these days at CACI, and kind of, you know, what is a growth and communications lead? Like sure. What's your role and what are you doing? Yeah, I kind of have three different hats in my role at CACI. Uh, while I'm sitting on what I, I described as the Agile Solution Factory, that's our capability, our tool, our best practices for Agile. Uh, and again, we've had some of the largest Agile at scale contracts in the federal government, and they've been doing that for, for decades now, and, and have had expertise specifically in the federal space for doing Agile scale programs. So I'm sitting on that center of excellence, and we have a, a, a lean team of, of experts that, that are giving best practices to help um, CACI, defense, 
federal programs to um, not only adopt Agile, but to really begin to add value back to those programs and do it in a very efficient, adaptable, transparent kind of a way. And so I'm serving in that role, um, but also working directly with business development and very closely as well with the marketing communications team. So while I don't sit you know, directly on those teams, I'm working with them hand in hand, going to trade shows, writing content, and writing white papers, blogs, social media content, um, getting the word out, creating a brand for our Agile Solution Factory. Okay, so it sounds like it's sort of, it's also an internal, as, has an internal aspect to it, and then obviously an, um, an outward facing to let people know about the expertise about a, a Agile software. Exactly, um, yeah, no, we, we work you know, hand in hand with a lot of those developers to help them to create the best experience for their, for their clients. We have this incredible culture that we've developed over years now. Um, and I've really appreciated that, that culture. And I think you, know, you see that in a lot more now in Silicon Valley. You see that now become um, a lot more commonplace now in federal defense. It's becoming more of not just a buzzword, it's becoming much more of this is the way that things are done now. And every, almost every other contract we're seeing now is coming out asking and requiring that Agile be incorporated into it. So now that we've already had years and years of this experience, we're not coming to the table saying, hey, we're ready to roll, we're ready to roll our sleeves up and, and really deliver results. Right, and sure, as, especially even in our industry as things become more digitalized and there's that computerized aspect to things, so there needs to be production of software that's kind of in a modern way as compared to the whole, you know, waterfall or, you know, kind of the slower kind of make the requirements and then roll out something years later, you know, it just, it seems so important to have yeah. um, kind of that method. Everyone's possible. talking about digital transformation these days. Yeah. Everyone's talking about modernization these days. But what that actually means behind the scenes when you peel the layers back, what do those processes look like? How are you, um, you know, really structuring your team? Um, how are you making things more efficient, giving more money back to the federal government so they're not just overspending and, and under delivering? You know, we want to deliver more and help them to pay less. You know, right. we say, hey, this is what their end product should look like, but let's talk about incremental things that we can deliver to you in the meantime. Right, sure, yeah. And then talk about, um, if you could, kind of, you know, what you see, you know, marketing and communications just seems like something that, unless you're not paying attention to it, um, it's just kind of there. But but it, it, it takes creating something. It takes a campaign and building something specific that's well designed it's not just like a snappy brochure there's more to it than that but you kind of explain like you know what is marketing in, in your view and why is it important why is it necessary the way I've heard marketing described before too is simplifying complex things and making sure that other people understand it and I know you know Albert Einstein's always talked about you know if you want to fully understand something you know not only you need to be able to explain it to somebody else and so that's really what in essence what marketing is is being able to explain something to somebody else that's digestible, they understand it, um, and they can share it. Because uh, that's what it's all about these days, is being able to share that information out to other people, to masses, to networks, and that's really how you get the word out these days, these grassroots type of marketing campaigns. And you can do that so well now with what we have on the web, with what we have with social media um, and, and SEO, and, and just the internet has allowed us you know, so much more digitization to how we can share information. And when you look at you know, marketing communications and, and, and how it differentiates, I mean, I know we're, we're talking about the private sector and what I've done there, but also in um, the defense space, it is very different. I think the one um, you know, main difference too is the fact that you know, it might take a month longer, right, in the defense space for things to be, to adapt and to change. And you know, that's where, again, Agile comes into, that, into play there and creating a culture for that. But when you look at um, you know, de developing marketing ideas. I mean, I've had maybe um, folks in the military space too wonder, well, why is social media important? <laughs> you know, I, I've heard that question many times. Like, why is this important? Should we be adopting this? Is this safe? Same kind of things you hear for, for cloud or for anything else, right? Is this, uh, and, and with, with reason, there's, there's reason that people might ask that. Um, because again, if we're going to spend federal dollars on something, we want to make sure that it's going to give us the bang for the buck that we're looking for. Uh, but the but the end result is different than in the private sector. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the private sector versus when you look at uh, the defense side, you're looking at creating awareness for mm -hmm. defense. 
in the private sector, you're looking to create sales. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, on in defense or military, with um, federal folks, you're just creating creating campaigns to help uh, a citizen maybe understand something better, get better access to something, a better another another resource on their website. Again, d digitization, modernization. How do we create more portals so that fo folks can get information or resources that they need? Uh, I worked at the Department of Labor, you know, doing benefits.gov, and and they were, you know, promoting too. Like, how do how do you get access to this information? We had a you know, 17 interagency agreement where we were working with all sorts of programs and agencies to to get their information out there to make sure that citizens knew what was available to them. Right. Sure. So there's there's nuances across. Obviously, we're in the defense industry with. Pentagon and the military and kind of on a global scale their operations and having to you know provide weapons and support you know their soldiers and whereas you know the private sector could be I don't know something completely different um, I guess what, what were some other differences that you saw you know across your career um, compared to what you're seeing now with the defense military industry or I guess DEFCON industry yeah and I guess one of the nuances or one of the challenges too to that right is that you're trying to maybe understand the return on investment a lot of times with marketing and communications. That's why a lot of times you'll get that question asked about social media. Or you'll get that question about, you know, why are we spending money on getting our name out there? It's like, well, because if, if you aren't spending the money to get to get your name out there, you'll not, you might lose funding later because no one knows who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I remember experiencing at, at, on different uh, defense agencies and stuff too because you know, at the end of the day, if, if folks on Congress don't know where their money is going towards, if the if um, you know tax dollars aren't you know being spent where where they feel people are aware of what's going on, then then that's a, almost a moot point, and you know you'll you'll you potentially lose funding there. So they want to make sure that they continue to not only get the word out for the great work that they're doing, um, but make sure that 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 everyone involved, whether it's the decision makers or even the citizens, are are getting uh, access to this information. Right, and I think you also worked in the chemical biological field. During COVID, what was that like? What's and what did you learn there? I guess. Yeah, so I supported a contract that was part of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and uh, I was on the Chemical and Biological Defense uh, Department uh, out of that that agency. And you know, it was very unique working there in the middle of things kind of transitioning under COVID and everything too. We had, I remember in 2019, we had you know had a trade show uh, or a conference that we put on, and you know, two years later we were going to have another one, but. Obviously, being in that field, we couldn't then promote another conference that was going to be, um, you know, talking about uh, chemical and biological defense when, when a big, big time pandemic was going on, right? So it was definitely an interesting time, but also because you know that their name was out there in in the field, where they were looking for solutions, they were getting things done. Uh, at first, you know, it was not a defense type of, of, of spending where where you know military money was going towards that. It was more on the on the CDC side, it was more on the HHS side, and everything too. So. Uh, it wasn't until later on that, that they started to really look at, um, you know, some of the, the the areas that that defense could really play into, you know, coming up with solutions for for COVID, and um, but but yeah, being a part of that well, was pretty interesting. I learned a lot, and um, it was you know definitely an area that I, I you know I felt like it will set me up for a lot more experiences and you know down the road. Gotcha. And what do you advise? What kind of advice do you have to someone who wants to get into marketing? Um, whether they're studying it in college now or they've been in some other field, um, any any advice there? Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke to some of the tools and or at least some of the areas of uh, that I have used in the workplace stuff today. I think you know, looking back, I I, I remember coming back uh, when I worked at Booz Allen. I worked there for four years, coming right out of school, and some of the first things I learned out of the gate were some of these agile practices. Um, I, I learned a lot about product management using t like product management tools. I remember using CRMs and Salesforce and things in that realm. And I remember thinking, you know, I never really actually learned or used any of these tools when I was in college. And I wish mm -hmm. that maybe they, they had taught some of those things and maybe maybe they did management or those kind of things. But I, I did find, because I had some interns this summer and I'm like, mm -hmm. they, are, they are now teaching Agile in, in school. Actually at JMU, we had, a, had an intern there. but. Um, but they are now teaching it, and so it's good to hear yeah. that that it's making it, you know, to higher ed. It's making it to the colleges, and uh, they're beginning to, to wake up that this is the kind of things that um, that we're going to be doing in the workplace. And being able to mirror what was happening in the workplace mm -hmm. back at, in colleges is is so important. Um, and I know I've learned again so much just from 
you know, being in the field, working with people, um, and I've always found that I, I learned more out of the classroom than I ever did in, uh, and that's just, I guess, my, my right. personal right. way of, of learning, but I was super involved when I was on campus. You know, I, I was somebody that was volunteering for things, stepping up into leadership roles, and I learned so much just with dealing with people, working with people, um, you know, and, and communication skills, all of those things I felt are so invaluable because the way things are changing nowadays with, with roles, positions, 15, 18, 20 years ago, there was nothing, no, no such thing as a social media manager. Right, yeah. Two decades from now, who knows what roles, positions are gonna be out there? Who knows which roles or positions are gonna be, are gonna be gone? And so I think having a base of those kind of skill sets, being a great leader, being a great communicator, that's what's gonna set you up for success down the road. Being able to talk with people, I, I went to a, a university relations, uh, we were talking to, to, to potential interns, and just the things that stood out to me, just how well somebody could, could have, a, have and hold a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their confidence level, right, their attitude. Those aren't things that, that you can, you know, you can have those things and that will go a long way. You can learn skill sets. Like I said, I learned HTML in one week and uh, not, not that that's a, a huge accomplishment. I'm sure there's a <laughs> lot of developers and stuff that are like, that's a piece of cake. But for me, like, I'm like, I never learned that in school. And, but, um, but being able to be adaptable, being able to learn new things, being coachable, realizing that you don't know it all. I think right, a lot of yeah. folks come out of school thinking they, 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 they know a lot more than they really do, and I think I was one of them. <laughs> right, right. And uh, I think you, know, you, you have maybe a, a gut check moment, a wake up call where you say, you know what, uh, let me just humble myself and learn as much as possible, dive into some great books, um, dive into some great podcasts, right. <laughs> learn a lot, right? And get around people that know more than you, because when you can get people that, that mentor you, that pour into you, that's where you'll learn. Seek out that. Seek out ways to get ahead. Seek out ways to to volunteer. Get involved. Get motivated, and, and get going. I really like that. Get going. And kind of, what is your experience in student body government back in college? What kind of, how did that help you? And and I guess for anybody who's interested in that, you know, how that can help in a career even. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I learned a lot about um, leadership, working with people, communication skills. I mean, that that was a big piece of that for me. I because of my affinity to marketing. Um, I, I ran some campaigns for myself mm -hmm. too. I ran oh, no. uh, in my, my freshman year, I remember running for um, class president and I, I, I won that two years in a row. Uh, I remember creating a brand for myself and had a lot of fun with it really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, created a campaign, did some marketing, did some grassroots marketing, created a team and just had a lot of fun with that. You know, And, and uh, sure enough, I had people that really just spoke into me. They said, Matt, I think, I, I think you should run for this. You know, And I was like, you, what do you think you know and and, and uh, it just again just having people around you that believe in you that, that, that believe that you can do something makes a big difference because um, I don't know if I knew uh, in, that I could do that sure. uh, I knew I wanted to get involved I knew I want to have an impact uh, I remember just seeing back in like high school for example um, sometimes people getting elected to positions not for the best reasons right sure um, and uh, just because you know they're the class clown or because they are, are popular for whatever reason. And you know, I was like, you know, I, I really want to make an impact. I really want to get involved because um, my heart's in it and because I want to be a good leader. I want to be a good example for people. And, and that's what really inspired me to run. And, and again, people pouring into me and telling me I could. And uh, that's ultimately what made me want to run for student body president. And I did that and had some challenges running against different folks, debating and having conversations and um, campaigning. And um, But ultimately ended up winning. and. Um, and, and had a great time just being a part of the transition for a new president that came in um, at the university um, and, and you know, ha had a good time learning. In fact, my, my wife too, she uh, it was also, that's how we met, was in oh, student okay. government. And uh, she was, I met her in her freshman year, I was a junior, and, and she actually ended up winning student body vice president two years later, not at the same time. All right. But, um, but it was fun seeing her accomplish that as well. Yeah, I, so. lo I love that experience, that, and how neat. Um, that you found your, you know, your spouse for life, kind of while you're building those leadership skills. Absolutely, another perk, right, for for what to look right. for when you're looking for a college, I guess, right? right so, yeah. <laughs> and um, kind of, you know, I met you through AFCIA Nova, which is the Northern Virginia chapter. For me, that's the, you know, we're here in Fairfax, and that's my home chapter, um, and that's the chapter you're involved in as well. Tell us about your role there, and um, kind of what the emerging leaders are up to, and kind of what you're up to. Sure, so I'm actually the communications lead for the emerging leaders out of AFCIA Nova, and I've been in that role since February, um, and or at least just around February, because I met 
Um, some of these guys, uh, some of the people on the team um, that were out west, um, and I was out there, and I had known about FC for a while. I'd, I'd known a lot about Signal Magazine. Um, I'd, I'd seen them at different offices and things that I've been to sitting around, and I've, I've always been interested in what it was all about, reading some of the articles and everything in there, and uh, knowing some people at CACI that um, were, were volunteering with, with FCA, it just piqued my interest. And uh, I, I asked, I asked uh, you know, my friend just about that a little bit more, and he said, I think you should, you should think about it. And, and then sure enough, I ran into two more that were uh, uh, people from the team, leaders from the team, and they said, you should come out to our next event. You know, and sure enough, I did. And um, you know, the rest is history. I've been, I've been involved with it now and, and you know, serving in a communications role, similar to kind of what I do now already too. So it kind of worked hand in hand with a lot of the things I'm interested in already with communications and marketing. Uh, so that worked out really nicely. But I've always wanted to, I mean, and, and continue to serve even beyond, um, you know, being my experience in student government at JMU. Um, coming out, I, you know, for four years, I was a part of the Metro Dukes at JMU or at, a part of their JMU Alumni Association. Uh, and that was the alumni chapter up here in the DC metro area, the largest in, you know, in the, in the whole you know, United States for, for JMU uh, alumni. It's just so massive, so many people in this area, right? But, um, but I served in that role for four years. And, um, and then once I kind of left that role, I was kind of looking for that, that next area of, of, of growth, of, of, of service and uh, of leadership and ways that I can kind of give and, and step into some leadership roles outside of, uh, outside of work. And, um, you know, sure enough, again, this, this kind of landed uh, at, the, at the right time that I was looking for that and, and looked for a way to get, it, to get ahead in kind of this industry. And FC has really lent a, a great networking hand for that, for that piece. Right. And that's good advice, too, to kind of maybe, you know, if you're young in your career or just graduating college, you know, find an organization that, you know, you, even if it's a fun thing as a, you know, college alumni association or some other, you know, group or entity, and then that can be a stepping stone to how you are in a professional association like FCA or, or other organizations, um, you know, because it, it does bring together, um, you know, many opportunities to, you know, learn in your field and learn who the players are and, you know, an or organization that has, you know, chapter events and luncheons and versus, you know, a big annual conference somewhere, there's, there's, there's a lot, I guess, to to be able to walk around in and it sounds like you know having kind of an early on experience helped you there with a different type of, of group yeah it's really mirrored a lot of what we were doing here mm -hmm. too with, with some of the experiences and some of the the chairs and roles as part of the team okay. um, and so that was a big part of um, you know what made me want to continue uh, serving in different capacities right and what would you say like if somebody's um, in this area you know kind of what are good ways to get involved as an emerging leader? Um, and maybe not just in Fairfax, but maybe what, what are you guys up to in the chapter that, that emerging leaders should look out for, or even advice for you know emerging leaders around the country, I guess? Yeah, ways that emerging leaders can get more involved is, I mean, I think uh, just being a part of those, like you said, those, those luncheons are, are a great way to get around and meet some of these folks that are in these, um, you know, that are already involved with FCA. I think it's also a great way because the emerging leaders really is a, a great stepping stone to the larger chapter, and I think just just getting showing face, being someone that's um, actively volunteering, uh, serving that 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 community, the more they're going to see that that you truly are not only an emerging leader in your field but also within AFCIA, and they might see you in other roles. They might recommend you for other positions in in AFCIA. and I think it also might lend you to. You know, potentially new, um, not only different BD opportunities, but even some maybe job opportunities. Just knowing more people has never really hurt anybody, right? I mean, I think right. we're in a yeah. well-connected society these days. Everyone's on, on LinkedIn, everyone's on different social media websites, and stuff like that these days. And so being able to connect with other people, uh, the emerging leaders, the FCA networking group has, has shown to be a very strong one, I've noticed. Right, sure. And even just to see other people who are in the, the trenches you know, uh, at your age or around your age, like, you know, oh, this is, how is this going? And, you know, it kind of helps you with your career to even have other people talk to you. Oh, what's your experience? And what's that like? And, you know, to be able to kind of interact with, and kind of get some, I don't know, inside baseball or just tips for, or perspective um, for yourself and your career. I I feel like when I, I started out as a consultant years ago and, and, it, and you know, we kind of had, you know, principal investigators within the consulting firm who would, you know, were subject matter experts in their field, and and so we, 
you know, I learned a lot from them, but it was, I, I didn't feel like I had, you know, other organizations outside my company that I kind of interacted with. So I felt like kind of just, you know, pigeonholed maybe. I don't know. So I yeah. love that, um, you know, just to encourage people to take a step and, you know, find an organization to kind of. Yeah, find, find an organization, find people, find mentors, find people that are just going to, again, pour into you see you as valuable to their organization, see you for what you can add and provide. Again, even in volunteering and in, in, in other organizations can also lend new skill sets to your repertoire. It can add new things that maybe, you know, leading or serving in a, in a role can give you some great leadership skills, right? Or serving, maybe if I wasn't doing communications, uh, serving in a different, you know, uh, piece of, of FCA would lend to a new skill set for me that I can now add to, to my resume or something like that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, getting around a, a great group of folks that knows what they're doing, they're, you know, you're learning kind of what's on the, the cutting edge, what's trending in, in, that, um, in, in that sector, in that uh, industry, I think is a huge part of, of getting around like-minded people. They say you're the, the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Yeah. Oh, I've never heard that. I you like know, that. And, uh, <laughs> including, I mean, that, that includes the books you read, the things you listen to, the things you watch, and all of that. I mean, it's going to be a big part of who you are. And so, you know, seek out information. Read, read what's, you know, trending in, 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 in that industry, in that sector. But, um, but also, you know, again, seek out that information that's going to help you to, to, to gain traction, to move forward, and uh, to become better uh, every day. Right, sure. And I love, to, I love to talk about the kind of perspectives from different generations. So, you know, even as a reporter, despite my like almost appendage that I have my as my phone, you know, having it so close all the time, I didn't see a computer till high school. You know, back in my day. Um, so, and obviously, you know, having digital natives and digital fluency, you know, from other generations, kind of, what's your perspective there? Of kind of what's unique about your perspective from your generation, especially when it comes to you know digitalness, I guess. Yeah, I mean, like I was saying before, I mean, I think we have more access today to information than, than ever, right? You can learn a new skill set um, within a week. You can you can uh, adapt and change. I, I've seen folks that go to school with one major, and they come out, and they pursue something entirely different, right? And uh, I think that's not totally uncommon. And, and like I was mentioning before, there's never there wasn't a, a social media manager position 10, 15 years ago, we've become more adaptable than ever, and we have when we have to because there's new things out there. I mean, just AI is now taking things by storm, and people are starting to, to I think, wake up. You know, I think our generation is becoming more um, resilient to these ideas of frameworks. Right? We're seeing more folks that are uh, Gen Z, Gen Y, and they're becoming CEOs. They're becoming the leaders in their industry sometimes, and you know, they can flip the whole industry on on its head with. Um, you know, you have, again, leaders that are, are maybe, you know, boomers are now reporting to uh, someone that's a Gen Y, and that's not un totally yeah. uncommon anymore. Uh, whereas before, it used to be this, um, you know, bottom to top, or top, or top to bottom, that is, uh, approach, versus, you know, now I think it's a lot more, um, you know, even keeled, and, and folks are also realizing that we don't necessarily have to go into an office anymore. Um, and I can, I can work wherever. In fact, you know, folks are, are realizing they don't have to have uh, the, the way things are done aren't, aren't necessarily the same anymore. We're seeing, you know, kids that, that are eight years old opening presents online making millions of dollars, right? The way you make income is very different today too, and, and the way that people get ahead is very different. And uh, you can pivot, you can change, you can adapt, and I think people are realizing that, and they're starting to say, how can I now apply that to my workplace? How can I apply that, that same kind of, uh, you know, adaptability to a project that I'm on? realizing that we have to be ahead of the game, realizing that things can change on a dime. And uh, we, we, have to, we have to be uh, always on the lookout for the next big thing uh, is gonna be here. And I think you know, a couple of years ago, pe people were talking about the metaverse and, and VR, and, and while that's still uh, on the horizon too, I mean, AI did come out of, uh, out of nowhere this year, and all of a sudden people are talking about that a lot more. And we're seeing that integration of things and um, uh, of different you know, tools and, and ideas. So, Again, I think you know we look back at uh, how much people are learning, how quickly they they have access to information. I think is is a big game changer for this right. for this generation. Yeah, and I wonder with the next generation, you know, coming along, they'll be like AI generative AI natives. You know, what will that be like? What will that bring? You know, for the future. I'm just looking forward to once it's on my phone, I can talk to it. It can talk back. Right. I can, you know, there's a definitely a lot more growth. I think that are that's on the yeah. table here. 
um, not even just from a defense perspective, but even from just a product consumer perspective. And, and you're right, to an everyday working um, perspective. In fact, we, again, we had interns and stuff this summer. They were very interested in AI. You know, oh, they, yeah. hear, they hear about it every day. Right. They, they hear about it in their classrooms. People are talking about it. People are using it in schools these yeah. days. You know, writing, I wish it was around when I was writing essays for school <laughs> and stuff too. But yeah. pe- even yeah. the classrooms are learning to adapt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we do too. We all right. have to. Uh, we also just learn to adapt with it and, and integrate it because it's going to be a big part of uh, you know uh, of the future, I believe. So. Yeah, that's great advice. And anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I, I just think again, going back to just being a, a great networker, being um, you know, uh, looking at for the the best uh, things in the industry to, to get ahead. I think just being somewhat an open learner. I've always found that every position I've been in, I've learned something new. Mm-hmm. You know, and so don't. Don't ever look at a role and say, man, I can't, I, I, there's no growth here. There's no uh, way to move ahead or there's nothing to learn. There's always something that you can learn wherever you are um, and just add value as much as you can. Because you, if you add value to, to somebody, whether it's somebody you've taken under your wing to mentor or, or even someone who's more senior to you, they'll take note of that. They'll right. appreciate that. And whether or not that helps you now, it might help you down the road, right? And so that's why I've always found, hey, leave people better where, than you found them, and, and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll do very well. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Time Absolutely.